Awesome, very cool. So I'm uh, Stephen Frost. You might have seen me before at this conference. Um, maybe not, I could be wrong. You might have missed the opening, that's fine too. You probably got email from me, right? A whole bunch of email. <laughs> Hopefully not too much email. All right, so we're gonna be um, talking about slow queries and, uh, and fixing them. So a bit more about me, um, just for, for giggles. I'm the CTO at Crunchy Data. I'm also a committer, major contributor for Postgres. Worked on role of security in 9.5, did column all privileges in 8.4. I wrote the role system, uh, which is fun. And I've done contributions to uh, PLP, GSQL, and PostGIS. Um, all right, so when it comes to finding slow queries, right, there's kind of three main approaches that I encourage people to use. Um, first of all is you know, logging basically everything in the world. Uh, there's upsides and downsides to this, but the upside is that you get lots and lots of information. The downside is logging can actually slow your system down. So that's something to be aware of and to be cognizant of and, and something to be considering, right? Once you've done that, the next thing is doing log analysis, right? So with all those logs, you get tons and tons and tons and tons of logs, but you need to do log analysis. So one of the ways that you do that is with PG Badger. Uh, this has become kind of my favorite go-to tool and I'll even you know, show some results of it uh, as we get through this presentation so you can take a look at it. A newer capability that people may not be familiar with is something called PG Stat Statements. I'm gonna talk about PG Stat Statements and how you can use that to look at what queries are running in your system. And this is something that you can run as the database is running and you can see the queries that are being run kind of right then, right? With PG Badger, you have to log the query and then after the query has been logged, go back to it and pull out uh, all the statistics and whatnot, PG stat statements is, is live, right? It's, it's what's happening right now kind of information, which is really, really handy. So when it comes to logging, there's a lot of different options in PostgreSQL.conf, and these are all really very important, at least in my opinion. These are the things that you wanna be looking at. I'm gonna go through each one of these and talk about why they're important and what, what matters to them. So first off, logmin duration statement. So this is what really allows us to get the information that we need in the log file for something like PG Badger or even some of the other tools to actually be able to analyze those queries and roll them up and give you that, the statistical information that you're, log you know, you're looking for, right? So setting it to zero means you're gonna log every single statement sent, right? Um, if you wanna set it to be a little bit less aggressive than that, you can set the number uh, above zero. The number is in milliseconds by default. Um, I think you can actually add in what unit you want in there. We've done some, made some improvements, especially in like 9.5 to allow that. Um, and then whenever a query takes longer than that, like so you could set it to a second, you could set it to 100 milliseconds, you could set it to 50 milliseconds, depending on what your environment is. And then what happens is that it actually logs the query and that query log includes the duration on the same line as the query was, right? So here you can see in the result a duration of a one second query uh, which is about a thousand milliseconds. And you can see both the duration and the statement on the same lo uh, log line. Right? This is really important for log analysis tools. If you're using log statement and log duration, you end up with those on, on two different lines, right? which it becomes much more difficult to, to analyze. So you definitely want to be using log min duration statements set to zero. The next thing is that we need a log line prefix, right? Especially if you're using the built-in Postgres logging, this is kind of the one that I like to use. Um, it's, it's essentially ripped from exactly what PG Badger is looking for by default, which I find to be really quite a good, uh, quite a good logline prefix. Although people can have other options, and you can customize it if you want. And PG Badger actually allows you to do options to set it to whatever to configure it so that it knows what kind of logline prefix you have. So in this particular one, we have the timestamp. This is really important for being able to do an analysis across time of you know, when a query ran and how much, um, you know, so that gives you more than just duration, it's when the query ran and you can tell what the time frame, uh, time f uh, frame is for the beginning and ending of your reports. Um, process ID, session line number, these are pretty straightforward. Uh, who the logged in user is. So th this one's kind of interesting. It's actually the user that logged into the database. Um, if you change user using something like set role, this doesn't update, right? It'll still be the, the user that it was logged in as. So that's something to just be aware of when you're using that. Uh, the database that it was logged into, application name if set. So um, something people may not be aware of is we have this capability to have this application name, 
right? And PSQL will set that to PSQL, PG admin will set it. But if you're writing your own custom code, you can have this set to essentially whatever you want for each database connection. And that can be really handy for being able to break up your log file based on what applications are connecting. So uh, it might be something to look into, although I'm not going to cover it in detail here. Uh, and then, of course, the remote host. And then this percent %q just basically means stop adding a logline prefix when we hit this. And you'll see why that matters here in a minute. But for example, here we have just a simple statement um, which includes this logline prefix. So obviously, you see that's got a lot more information on it than the prior one, right? which just had the log duration and statement. This one actually includes the timestamp and other information that's really necessary to get that, uh, to be able to do the analysis that you want. The next thing is log checkpoints. Uh, checkpoints are things that uh, the database does periodically, right? By default, every five minutes or so, it'll do a checkpoint, which means we're going to write out all the data to the data, uh, to the backing uh, heap files, right? To the data files. Um, log checkpoints is going to tell us all the information about when a checkpoint started, why it started, how long it ran, and a whole bunch of other really useful statistical information that tools like PG Badger can pick up and provide information to you about. Um, one of the things when I go into a place and people are complaining that, well, slow queries are happening, but it's like every couple minutes, right? It's like, okay, that's probably because every few minutes a checkpoint starts and we write out all of the data. And while we're writing out all of the data, all of your, you know, your entire system ends up being slower and queries are slower. So that's something to be looking for. And sometimes you can correlate that between, um, you know, logging of check, between when the checkpoints are happening versus when the queries are happening. So that's really useful information. Uh, this is just straight up connection logging information, just logging the connections and disconnections is pretty straightforward. Uh, really important and really useful, but not too, uh, not too complicated. So this, you actually end up with three log entries. You get a connection received entry, and then you get the actual authentication um, information when the connection's been authorized, and then you get a disconnection. So this can help you analyze how long uh, connections have been uh, made to the database. And in particular, if you have a lot of short-lived connections, that's usually a bad thing. You want to um, actually use a connection pool or something along those lines to help improve your performance. So one of the things that people run into when they're trying to figure out why things are slow is that, well, they're connecting for every query, right? Which is ridiculously slow. Um, and it takes a lot of time. Yes? This is connections. Oh, my bullets are wrong. You're right. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. My bullets are wrong on that one. My bad. So this is. This, uh, the bullets were supposed to be updated, but I guess I missed that slide. Okay, sorry. All right, logging of lock weights. This is another one that's really, really important that people don't always realize, right? Why is your query slow? Well, maybe it's waiting on a lock, right? This happens all the time and people don't know it. Well, if you turn on log lock weights, after one second, Postgres does something called a deadlock check, okay? And it will run this um, deadlock checking uh, routine that is looking to see if there's any deadlocks between the existing queries that are running. So I'm waiting on a lock. If you know, somebody else is waiting on me for a lock, you know, we can end up with a deadlock. So we have this deadlock detection. But the other thing that happens during deadlock detection is that we have uh, an opportunity to say, OK, these are all of the locks that are in the system, and who's waiting on who? So after a query has been waiting on a lock for more than a second, if you enable log lock weights, you get this really handy information about who's waiting on who. So in this case, you can see that I have one connection, one process. This is going to be difficult for me. I can't see the slides. Um, but you know, the, essentially, the first line is saying, we're still waiting. This process, 29554, is still waiting for this share lock on this transaction. Right? After we've been waiting around for a second, Deadlock timeout hit, we ran the deadlock checker, we found out that we're waiting on a lock. Right? And we also know who's holding that lock. Right? So this process 29617 is holding the lock that we need. All right? And we also have the information about what kind of lock. So in this case, we're um, sitting on a tuple lock. Right? So the way this happened was is that I went into one session, I did a select star for update on a table. Then I started another session and did a select star for update on that other uh, session, right? And so we actually see the tuple, and we see what tuple um, it is, right, as well. That's 0, 1. That's the first tuple on the table, basically. And we see what the relation is. And then we see what the statement I was running was. Right? So this is very, very useful information for doing um, deadlock ana or, uh, lock analysis, 
So if, if, if you don't have this enabled, definitely recommend it. Another thing that can cause problems is temp files, right? Whenever you have temp files being created, that means the database is having to do some amount of disk I.O., some amount of work where we're actually writing data out, right? In this case, you can see that I ran a, a select star from T1 order by one. So what's happened is that we're doing a sort, right? And what that sort is trying to do is do a, uh, and it's, it's using a temp file to do the sort. That tends to be expensive because it means you're going out to disk to do a sort, right? A disk-based sort. So the way you can detect this and realize it is by logging these temp files that Postgres creates, right? And you just set log temp files equal to zero, and then every time Postgres creates a temp file when it's trying to run a query for anything, it's going to log information about what that query was. And that can be really helpful for figuring out, okay, this slow query, the reason it's slow is because it's using a lot of disk. And now I can go look at that particular query and say, okay, why is it using all of these temp files, right? Is it doing a disk-based sort or is it doing, you know, something else? Yeah. Um, do having many of these require you to restart So all of these that I've covered, all of these logging options require a reload only. Um, there are some options that require a restart, but none of these do. So feel free to ask me questions as we go. Um, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'll just kind of keep plowing through things. All right, so log temp file. So log auto vacuum. So another thing that people often complain about is, hey, auto vacuum's running, right? And it's vacuuming stuff, and it's killing my system, and I want to stop it, right? Don't ever do that for starters, because then it just becomes a real problem, because you end up with a lot of bloat. And I'll talk about bloat in a bit. Um, but if you're curious about what the heck auto vacuum is doing, enable this. Log auto vacuum min duration, set it to zero. That way you see everything that vacuum is doing across every table every time. And you get all of this wonderful information out of that about how many dead tuples there were found, how many it was able to mark as completely removed, how many are dead but not removable. Lots of really great information that you get back from um, log auto vacuum min duration that allows you to really do this kind of analysis work. You also get to see you know, what kind of system utilization was required and how long that auto vacuum step took. All right, so now we're going to talk about a bit of log analysis, right? So PG Badger is the tool, and it's actually really, really straightforward, right? Um, there are some other tools out there, but PG Badger is definitely my favorite. Um, on a Debian-based system, it's just app get install PG Badger, right? That's it, you're done. All you have to do is run PG Badger and pass in the log file, and that's it. You've got it, right? That's, that's all you have to do, and it's fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, I'm going to try. We'll see how well this works. But if I'm lucky, I will be able to bring up the, there it is, report. Look at that. So this is going to be, again, pretty tricky. I'm trying not to move too far because they're recording this. But here you can see the, the statistics that are available uh, with PG Badger, right? And this is just, you know, these are just some global stats. One of my favorite things to do with PG Badger, though, is to come over here and look at things like, you know, most frequent queries. So here what I've done is I've used something called PG Bench, right? So I've run PG Bench against my system um, a couple of different times, and now I have all this nice information about, okay, you know, this query, here's the time total, um, you know, the minimum amount of time it took to run, the maximum, the average time it took to run. So lots and lots of really detailed information for finding these queries. Another, uh, so there's, I mean, I, I could spend an entire talk just talking about PG Badger. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that kind of time. But, you know, another good one is this histogram. So unfortunately, I don't have very many queries running. So it's not very interesting of a report here, but it can be really helpful. And you can see it's got this um, slow query, you know, ind slowest individual queries down here. Now, included in this is the actual loading of the PG bench data. So that's why you see that there. But, you know, there's lots and lots of detailed information in here about the different queries. I'm trying to figure out where they went. About the queries that are run inside of PG bench. So, that's what you can see um, from that report. So that's that copy. And then I think all those ends are basically whenever we're committing, whenever it does a commit, it does an end. And what that's going to do is um, that's going to require that we actually write in a write ahead log record and flush it to disk. So that's why it's going to take time. So, as I was going to say, the other one was 
time-consuming queries. Yeah, so this one's also really good. So this actually um, calculates, you know, over time, which ones took the longest amount of time. So here you can see these update statements, which are, you know, is not too surprising because there's just so many, um, so many times that they were executed that they end up being a large chunk of the overall time involved uh, in, the, uh, in this particular run of query information. So in here you can see these inserts are obviously taking up a significant amount of time also. Even though the individual queries aren't taking very much time, it's actually really interesting to see just how much uh, total time is taken. And then the other information that is particularly useful is when you see these kind of numbers, right, the min duration versus the max versus the average, here you can see something interesting is happening, right? Because what you see here is that there were times when these took a long time to run, right? 300 milliseconds for a given query. That's the kind of stuff that I end up doing a lot of analysis kind of work on. Ay, ay, ay. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> it is what it is. So anyway, so that's just, you know, a really, really, really handy tool. Um, like I said, definitely, you know, install it, run it against your logs, play with it. I'm not going to have time, unfortunately, to cover it in complete detail because we have a lot of other material to cover, but I definitely wanted to show everybody that. All right, so that, yes? So let's see, does that show up as the same query in PG Badger? I believe the answer is no, not on that, not with PG Badger. But what I'll show you is PG Stat statements, where we actually normalize the query and it will show up as the same query. Right? Right. Oh, okay. So you can get that information out of PG Badger as well? For the top ones, right. You can't get it for all of them. That, maybe that's what I was thinking of. You can't get it for all of them. You can get it for some of them, right? Whereas, um, yeah, so that's really pretty handy. Um, the other thing you can use, yeah, uh, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> any other questions on that? All right, I just want to, okay, good stuff. Okay, so PG stat statements that I was going to talk about is really, really handy. And, and so in order to install it, you have to add it to what's called shared preload libraries. Um, and then you have to, for this case, you have to restart Postgres because it's in shared preload library. You actually have to restart it. And then after you've restarted Postgres, you have to log in and run this create extension statement, right? Create extension PG stat statements. All right, and here's what it looks like um, in terms of the different, all the different um, columns that you get. So what you actually have here is a view um, across a function that's provided by PG stat statements that provides out all of this information and essentially on a per query basis. Now, the number of queries that it stores is configurable, um, but when you change it, you do have to restart uh, Postgres for that because shared or a PG stat statement is using shared memory to be able to track all of this information um, about all of these. So unfortunately, if you do change it, you have to restart. I believe the default's like 5,000 though. So it, it's got a pretty good chunk of uh, space in there for the queries that you can see through this view. So the information you get out of this is, has a lot of similar information to what you saw in PG Badger, but it's more current because it hasn't had to be written out to a log file and then run through the log analyzer. So you get calls, you get total time, min, max, mean time, uh, standard deviation, number of rows that were returned by it. So lots of really useful information, and there's more, right? So you also get shared block hits, shared blocks uh, read, um, you know, how many blocks were dirtied or how many blocks were written. Um, all this really, really useful information is available through this PG stat statements view. So I'm not going to kind of go over each and every single one of these things, but if you have any questions about anything, I'm happy to try to answer. Awesome. Good stuff. So here's an example of when you actually run some queries and then look at the results. Again, this was done with PG Bench. Um, so here you can see there's a query ID that has been generated. That query ID is consistent for the most part for a given query. Um, it's essentially a hash of what that query is. There's been a lot of arguing um, inside of the Postgres community, so it's not something that you should necessarily trust across uh, Postgres major versions. 
Um, I think generally speaking, we try to say that it won't change across Postgres minor versions, although I wouldn't be surprised if that ends up happening at some point too. But so far, I don't believe it has. So what this does though, is it gives you the, uh, the query itself, the number of calls, and then again, total time. So here you can see you know, how much total time this running this query took. Um, now this is all by query ID and also by user, right? So I believe if you have different users running it, you'll get different entries inside of here as well. And then you can see number of rows and lots of really, really useful statistical information for doing analysis. So something that you might consider doing is periodically querying this table, right, for this information. Yes? Default retention for this information. So you can tell post, you can tell PD step statements to save it out and reload it um, on restart. Uh, and I think that's actually the default, but you can also turn it off. So as long as it's, you know, as long as it's within the queries that we're currently tracking, which again was at 5,000 max, it's going to continue to save that information. There is a reset option. There's a reset function inside of PD step statements that you can call to reset that information. Right, so that may be what you're really looking for is say, I want to reset it and then you know, for the next hour, I'll get the information and then I'll reset it again. So if you have something that's coming in periodically and checking it, that's typical to do. Any other questions on that? Yes? Do we know how much overhead there is? Um, I'll say it's not free, but I couldn't tell you offhand what the numbers are. Um, for how many percent or anything that it is. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't have that. I don't think it's that much, but it's going to really become, uh, come down to your workload probably is going to be the main issue. If you have lots and lots of really, really simple queries, it's going to have a larger impact than if you have uh, all, you know, fewer larger queries that are running. Any other questions on that? All right, good stuff. So here's just another example. This is just a straight up select. Um, query that's run. That's another example of a query ID. And here you can see how the query ID is a different ID because it's a different statement. Um, and one of the things that this will do, as was brought up before, is that even if you're not using prepared queries, this uh, PD stat statements in newer versions, I forget exactly where we changed it, but in newer versions will actually normalize the query for you and combine queries that look that have essentially the same parse tree, right? That look the same, even though they are not uh, using, even if you're not using prepared queries. So that's one of the really neat things. Older versions, if you were using prepared queries, it worked just fine. Um, but if you weren't, then they would be different records inside of the table, and that would, that sucked. <laughs> that wasn't helpful. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about, you know, understanding why queries are slow, right? So queries can be slow due to configuration issues, bloat, and query plan, right? And probably some other things, but these are the things that we're going to talk through here. So the first thing is Postgres configuration. I'm not going to go over all of these. There's lots and lots of different configuration options um, that you can see here. I'm going to talk through some of them as we go, and then I'll cover a few at the end as well. Um, but just be aware of these things all being ones that you want to be particularly looking at in the Postgres config file for consideration. All right, dead tuples and bloat. So the way Postgres handles dead tuples is with vacuum, right? So vacuum goes through and marks records as reusable. Um, reusable tuples are used for doing new inserts and updates in, as we go through and make changes to the table and insert or update things. But if those tuples exist inside of the table, Postgres has to consider them, right? Tables can have lots and lots of dead tuples. Indexes can have bloat too. And so there can be cases where you want to consider re-indexing, right? Particularly if the index has changed significantly. So you know, if you're doing something like a time-based index, one of the problems you can run into if you use the same index and you don't use any partitioning is that you can have a case where the, the range of values that you're now indexing is completely different than what you were indexing a week ago, right? Because now everything's shifted, you've rolled off the old week, you have a new week that you're doing, and all the old records are gone, right? But we still have to have all of the middle pieces and all of the pointers to all of those. So you can end up with uh, index bloat in those cases. So that's something to be aware of, right? So there can be cases where it makes sense to re-index. Although I try to discourage people from doing like, well, we're just going to re-index every week kind of approach because that's a little bit too hard and fast uh, of a rule in my opinion. But definitely look for bloat and consider if you want to be uh, re-indexing uh, more frequently than you are today. 
or if you're not at all. Um, check Postgres is a great tool. So if you're using Nagios or anything that looks like Nagios, check postgres.pl uh, can be very helpful. I will say that it helps you identify tables that you probably want to look at to consider if there's bloat there. Don't necessarily take its metric as being gospel though, right? Because some bloat is definitely very useful and some tables, maybe a lot of bloat is useful, right? Um, what, you know, what happens is that if you don't have room in the table for a new record to go in, we have to do a relation extension and that can be very expensive in Postgres, right? And that, you know, and so there's a lot of cases where it's actually better to have that room, um, assuming you have the disk space for it inside of the table to be able to insert that new query rather than actually having to go and extend the relation itself, take out a, a heavyweight lock to do that, which can be kind of painful. Um, and especially if you're doing lots of concurrent bulk loading, that's where it gets to be really, really painful. Um, eliminating all bloat actually requires us to rewrite the table. Um, cluster and vacuum full are both options for doing that. I wouldn't generally recommend it. Uh, cluster though allows you to rewrite the table in the order of a particular index, which can be useful in some cases. Although because Postgres's secondary indexes just index directly against the table, unlike in some other uh, systems, it's not as big a deal to cluster around your primary key, right? In a lot of systems, it's really, really important to have it clustered around your primary key because everything is being looked up via that whenever you're using any indexes, right? We don't do that in Postgres. So it's not as big a deal. Um, you may still want to do it if you have one index that you really hit really hard and you find that it's valuable to have it clustered, especially if you're doing something like an index only scan across that table, okay, right? I can see reasons why you might want to do that, but I wouldn't necessarily go to it immediately. Generally speaking though, I would recommend clustering instead of vacuum full. Um, it's kind of my go-to because the, at least then you, you know, it's clustered at least once. Note that in cluster in Postgres though, does not, it's not maintained, right? So cluster is a one-time operation, takes out a heavyweight lock and then it's not maintained. So just something to be aware of. All right, so let's talk about how Postgres gets data, right? Whenever we get data out of the database, you know, and this is how all gonna fold into how query plans work, right? So what we have to do is we have to get the information from the disk. One of the approaches is sequential scan. What this does is it basically starts reading at the beginning of the table and goes all the way through to the end, uh, unless there's a limit clause on it, right? But it, we, generally speaking, you have to go through every single record. This is represented by uh, a seek scan node, right? It's great for bulk, uh, bulk operations. And it's also, if you look at um, query plans a lot, you'll see things like a bitmap heap scan, right? That's actually similar to a sequential scan in the way that it works. It starts at the beginning and goes to the end, but it only visits the records that um, were noticed in the index as having potential uh, pages. So bitmap heap scans can be really helpful. And it's something uh, some people may know, it as, uh, know it as a, a skipping scan, right? Where you're, you're skipping over sets of pages that are not interesting to you. The other approach that we can use is to use an index, right? So we scan through the index, and this is gonna be represented through an index scan node, um, and find those specific entries inside of the index that we need, and then go back over to the heap and pull out the data that we want, right? Um, this often ends up uh, being a forgotten piece, right? You end up not creating the index that you need, and that's one of the reasons why queries can end up being slow, because we don't have an index we're gonna be doing sequential scans um, across the table to be able to pull out the information that you're looking for. One of the other nice things about an index is that the data can be returned in order, right? And this can be really helpful for certain type of, types of plans like merge join like we'll talk about in just a minute. The other really cool thing that Postgres has is index only scans. Now, one of the things that you have to realize is that index only scans are actually index mostly scans, right? Because what's happening is that we have a visibility map this visibility map is maintained by um, vacuum and by auto vacuum. And that visibility map tracks which pages inside of the table are marked as what's called all visible. All visible tables mean that if the value that we want, if the column information that we want is in the index and the page is marked all visible, then we don't have to visit the heap, right? That means we know that that tuple is valid and we can just pull it out and return it directly to you, right? So that's an index only scan, but it does mean that you, it does mean that you have to have the columns in the index that you need, right? You must be using vacuum. And there are cases where we'll still have to go visit the heap because not all of the tuples on that page are visible, right? And therefore we have to go visit the heap and figure out, okay, which ones are visible and which ones are not visible in that cases in particular, you know, for the individual index entry that we're looking at. 
Does that kind of make sense to everybody how that all works? So these are the ways that we can get information off the disk with Postgres. All right. So now we're talking about nested loop or talking about joins, right? How we're putting these things together. So we have a couple different ways of doing that. We have a nested loop join, and that means basically we step through one table, and every time we get a record from that table, we go look up the uh, record that in the other table that we need. Right? This can be really fast for small data sets, right? but it tends to suck for large data sets because we're you know, continually doing that index you know, lookup, even if it's an index lookup, can be slow because it adds a lot of time. Right? Merge join is our second join type. So what we're going to do is we're going to take both uh, tables that we're joining and we're going to sort them. Or we'll do an in-order index traversal depending on what we're doing. And then we're going to walk through them right? and combine where they actually um, end up matching. It, it can be pretty good for bulk operations, but sorting is expensive, right? Even doing an in-order index traversal can be expensive, right? So those are things that you have to be looking out for, right? Hash joins is the last one. It's kind of my favorite go-to. It's what I really like to have a lot of my joins doing. And what this does is this scans one table, right? Uh, typically the smaller table, but I've seen it go both ways. I've seen us scan the larger table. And then we take that scan and we build the heap or the hash with it, right? We build a hash table. And then we step through the other table looking up entries in the hash table, right? So that's how we implement a hash join. So what that means is that it does have a bit of a slow start, if you will, right? So one of the things that merge join with an index order traversal is really good at is when you have a few records that you want to pull back, right? You want like a top 10. Right? Especially if we can use the indexes to get that information out and then join them together um, between the two tables, that's glorious. Right? That's really fast. Hash join isn't good for that kind of an approach because we're going to go build a hash table of one table. That means we have to go through all of that table right, to build that hash table. Once we've done that, then we can step through the other table. So there are cases where that's not as good as doing a merge join or a nested loop join, but it's really great for doing kind of bulk work. Any questions about the different join types? All right, so aggregates. So when we want to pull things together, we want to do an aggregate. You have a summation or an average or something. We have basically two different types of aggregates, right? We have a group aggregate, which means that we're going to sort all the data, and then we're going to look through the data and say, OK, whenever the, our group by key matches, those two records are going to get combined together, right? And then once we've combined all of the records and we've moved on to the next set, we're going to output that, right? So this can be a case where you can potentially use a short circuit, right? Where if you have a limit involved, you can short circuit that group by. But generally speaking, it ends up being a case where sorting is expensive as usual, doing an in-order index traversal expensive as usual. So a lot of times what you actually want is a hash aggregation, right? Problem with the hash aggregation is that it's memory intensive. Otherwise, it's the same kind of concept as a hash, ta as a hash join where we scan the table, building a hash table as we go, and whenever we find entries that match, we combine them together. All right, so what's the best plan? It all depends, right? Um, the database tries to figure out the best plan by gathering statistics using analyze, vacuum analyze. You can look at what those statistics are inside of the PG statistic table. Auto vacuum also is gathering the statistical information that you need. Bad stats equals bad plans, right? So you want to be looking at explain analyze results and checking your results versus what Postgres estimated. And in, the, in many cases, you may want to increase your statistics target, right? Or maybe do something else to figure out why are you getting bad stats coming back? Why is Postgres getting a bad, you know, getting the wrong answer for how many uh, query, for how many rows or tuples are expected to come back? So. Automating collections of those plans. This is really important as well. So auto explain is a really helpful module. It allows you to get back the information about what all of the plans are in your uh, the queries that are being run. Right? So this is another one that's based on the length of time, and it logs the explain for the queries if the query took a certain amount of time. Right? So for, and this is enabled also with shared preload libraries. That means you have to restart Postgres when you're done. And then you can tell it, OK, log anything that took more than 50 milliseconds. Right? You can also tell it to log nested statements. So nested statements are ones that are, exist inside of another statement. And where that happens is something like PLPGSQL, right? So if you have stored procedures that you're running, those stored procedures are running, function, or running queries underneath of the query that ran the stored procedure. That's a nested query. You can get the explain information for those using auto explain.
That's one of the best use cases I have for using auto explain actually is logging into those nested statements because otherwise it can be a real pain to get that information out. Anybody have any questions about any of that? All right. So, a lot of different ways to, huh? Auto explain outputs to the log. Yeah, that's where they have the, the auto explain outputs to the log, to the Postgres log. All right, so analyzing planes. So explain provides a few different ways of getting information out. You can, you, you can get the explain output through XML, JSON, or YAML. Um, and then there's a, a couple different tools that are useful for analyzing them if you like graphical stuff. So PG Admin 3 and I guess PG Admin 4 also has um, a way of taking the query, running explain on it, and giving you the plan. Uh, explain.depez.com is fantastic. <laughs> Right? This is a really, really helpful tool for doing explain um, and for looking at explain information. All right, so now let's talk about what we're going to do, right? So there's a number of things that are low hanging fruit, right? If we have um, a sequential scan happening, you're only getting one record back and you're not doing any kind of aggregation or anything, you probably want an index, right? And you know, if you don't have an index and maybe you can't have an index for some reason, think about is there a way to constrain the information in a way using a conditional that you can use an index, right? Um, so that's one of the really important things. The next one, I talked a lot about the things I like. I like a hash join. I like a hash aggregate, right? What Postgres needs to make those happen is work memory, right? So if you have a small data set and you're seeing sorting happening or you're seeing a merge join used, what you can do is increase work mem, right? Increasing work mem means that Postgres has the opportunity to consider doing a hash join or a hash aggregate. If workmem is too low, it, even, it won't even consider it, right? Because it knows the hash table is gonna be a certain size and it's not even gonna consider that as part of a plan, right? So that's something to really be looking at. One other really cool thing with Postgres, you can set workmem on a connection, right? And you can have it change during that connection's lifetime through the application and setting it on that one connection won't impact the other connections. Right, so if you have a particular query that you know needs a lot of work mem, you can just increase work mem for that query and then reset it back and off you go. All right, another part, another thing I've run into is um, things like statistics, right? So if you have a large data set and you're seeing a nested loop happening, make sure that you've got current statistics, right? Make sure you've run analyze against it. What I see a lot of people happening is that, you know, if you've never run analyze across a table, Postgres just has this like default idea of how big the table is and what is in it. And that default is often wrong. So if you've just created or just loaded a big data set into a table, make sure you analyze it before you go on and do something with it, right? Because otherwise you can get just absolutely terrible plans. Another case is that if you have deletes that are really slow, right, and you've got foreign keys involved, Postgres doesn't require those foreign key references to be using an index, right? The table that is referenced has to have an index, but the tables referencing it don't, right? And if the tables referencing the foreign key don't have an index and you're doing deletes on the parent table, on the referred to table, Postgres is going to have to go sequentially scan the table that's referring to it to find the records and make sure there aren't any records referencing the record you're trying to delete, the value you're trying to delete, right? So that's another thing that's really important. So make sure you're creating indexes on the referring table side for those cases where you know you're going to be deleting records from the referred to table. All right, prepared queries are really, really helpful, although there's some caveats to it, right? So prepared queries means you basically plan it once and then run it multiple times, right? This avoids that cost of repeatedly planning it. Now, Postgres is a little bit tricky here, right? Postgres has this idea of generic and specific plans, okay? It's going to use both initially. It's going to actually, every time you run the query, it's got a generic plan that it created, but it, for the first five times, it's going to check and see, okay, if I generated a specific query plan for this particular um, set of values that are being passed in, is that a better plan or not, right? Once you've gotten past those first five times, if the generic plan always won out or was within some threshold, if I remember correctly, we're gonna go with the generic plan, okay, going forward. But if we decide that we haven't won every time and where that happens a lot is when you have constraint exclusion happening, then what'll happen is that Postgres will actually uh, keep using the more specific plans which do require a little bit of extra time, but it's usually worth it, right? Because the overall query ends up being, uh, being better. 
So here's how you can do and explain and explain and analyze using a prepared statement if you're not familiar with how to do that. You actually do the explain on the execute, on the explain ex analyze on the execute. All right, so let's talk about some different queries. So select count star from a table, right? A lot of people like to do this. I generally don't recommend it, but if you have to do it, you have to do it. What people don't always realize now is that indexes can actually help with this problem now, right? Because we can do an index only scan, it doesn't actually matter what the column is in the index. As long as there's at least one index on the table, we will be able to look through the index and check the visibility information from the visibility map across that table and calculate out the count star result much faster than having to scan through the table itself because the index is a lot smaller than the table. Right? So that's something to, to keep in mind if you, have to, if you have a count star kind of requirement is consider whether Postgres is using an index only scan there. And again, make sure your visibility map information is kept up to date because if it's not, we're still gonna scan the heap or we're gonna have to go back to the heap a lot which can actually end up being worse. All right, another one is toasting, right? So if you're not familiar with what toasting is, toasting is a case where um, Postgres will compress a large value and store it out of line um, for you so that the regular table and the pages inside of the regular table don't have like this huge block of stuff in it, right? So these are really, really important to realize. But what that means is that if you have a table where you've got five small columns and one really big column, like you've got a document in that last column or something, don't use select star, right? Because select star is gonna go get all of that information for all of those columns, even if you aren't going to ultimately use them, right? Instead, select out the individual columns that you want. Because if Postgres doesn't need that toasted value, right, doesn't need to return that column to you, we won't go and decompress it, right? We won't even go look for it, right? And that can actually make a pretty significant difference um, when pulling data out. So don't use select star if you can avoid it. Right? Um, the other thing is just regular columns, just pulling back all that data means you're transmitting more information. But I, I find that where it really matters is when you've got uh, toasting happening. Another one is watch out for comma joins. I really, really hate comma joins. Um, so because what you can have are missing conditions on joins, right? So here, you know, you can, here's a case where some, you know, and this is a query, it's a form of query that I have seen before and it's scary. Right? Somebody does a select distinct star from a bunch of tables and then they have a bunch of conditionals and they've forgotten one. Right? So they've forgotten to put a, a join condition between table C and the rest of them. So we end up generating a Cartesian product and then the distinct was thrown in by the developer because they're like, oh, I don't want all these duplicates. I'm gonna use distinct to trim it back down. Right? It's terrible, but I see it a lot. Right. In fact, generally speaking, if you see a select distinct, I usually say those are queries to go look for and analyze whether that distinct is really needed. Oftentimes, it's somebody forgot a join condition or has done something else you know, that was not intended. All right, so definitely those are things to be watching out for as well. Um, I strongly recommend using join syntax, right? So here you can see join uh, A, join B, using, right? This forces you to remember those join conditions between all the joins, right? And that way it becomes a lot less likely to forget them. Any questions about any of that? Yes? So how does the optimizer Oh, you're talking about in an inheritance environment? So we should still be able to do an index only scan on the individual child tables, but you have to create an index on the child tables, right? right? And then we can do a, then the count star can go and use the indexes on each individual one to do the counts and then it'll bring it all back together, right? So that, that's one way to do it. <clears throat> there are some other ways and I'll talk about that actually in a minute. So here's another one that I see people doing where you do an in Generally don't recommend using in when you can turn it into a join, right? A lot of times this can actually be done as a join instead. And that usually allows for more options available to Postgres for how to execute the query, right? And oftentimes there's a faster way of executing that kind of a query. Another one is if you're using not in, it's usually better to use not exists and use a correlated subquery if you can, right? Because that is something that Postgres can actually turn into what's called an anti-join or a left join, right? Where we want to do a join and then remove records that have been found that way. 
Um, the other way you can use the not in or even a not exist often is to just rewrite it as a left join where the other side is, is null, right? Or, or not null depending on what you're trying to do. But that's generally the idea that you want to use um, is that you can you know, do that as a, as a left join or a not exist. And that's usually a better form than using a not in. Right, because Postgres actually will go run whatever that thing inside of the not in is and return it all, and then you know you have this big lump of stuff that's not indexed, and we have to go scan every time we want to consider something. Yeah. It can, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the the point being made is that it, this does depend on the table sizes involved, right? If you have a very small table for the um, set of IDs, then it's perfectly reasonable to use um, a not in or an in in a lot of cases, whereas uh, actually rewriting it as a, as a join might not be as performant, although I find that it tends to be pretty good anyway. Yeah? Not in should never be used. OK, not in should never be used, according to this gentleman. <laughs> David also agrees, and so I think we've got a quorum there. Um, <laughs> So don't use not in. So if you see not in, don't use it. I mean, I generally agree with that, although some people might object. Yes, yes, that is also true. So null, null handling is another reason why you want to be uh, avoiding not in, because you can end up having the wrong result back if, you have, if you're using um, not in. All right, any other questions about that? Moving on. See, I'm not sure. What am I supposed to start? I've got like four minutes left, right? Yeah. All right, thank you. OK, CTEs. So some of the things that are, you know, there are some rules around using CTEs and something to consider when you're using CTEs is that you generally want to keep the results of a CTE small. So if you're not familiar with a CTE, it's this with construct, right? So it's a common table expression. And here you see with CTE as. In this case, the CTE, this is using a common table expression whenever you see with. But one of the things that you'd like to do is make sure that the result set coming back from a CTE is relatively small because Postgres will actually generate all of those records for you um, and then use those to fill in whatever you have that, re that CTE referenced later. And if that's a large set, that can end up being a, a bad idea. So what you want to do is kind of put your expensive stuff into the CTE and then any kind of post-processing or stuff you want to do afterwards or things you want to do with like this one big table that you're joining against, do that later on in the main part of the query, but use the CTE to kind of build up to that point, right? I, I find that happens quite often and is quite useful to do it that way. Um, not only that, but CTEs allow you to reuse that same result set over and over and over again. So if you have some kind of big expensive join, you can do this you know, create the CTE result from that, hopefully limiting it in some way that you only get down to a subset of the data. And then if you have to do multiple things across that data set, you can do those in the outer part of the query. Um, and that'll end up being more efficient than rerunning an expensive subselect over and over and over again, which is what would happen if you actually wrote those as individual subselects. So if you really, really want a fast count star, <laughs> and you just have a table that you want to figure out how big it is, you can just look in PG class. Now, this is based off of statistics, and so it's not something that you can trust as an exact, um, and it's only good for the entire table. But PG class has something called rel tuples that you can just go look at. So, if you want like a gross estimate for how big the table is, use PG class .rel tuples. Um, another approach is using triggers, right? So, if you actually need an accurate result, then what you can do is you can offload the cost of doing the count star during the query time, during select time, by increasing your write load, right? The amount of time it takes to add things. And you can do that using a trigger-based approach by having a trigger on whatever table it is that just goes and increments or decrements some value in, the, in a side table that you're using to keep track of what your count star is. So that's the other way of if you really have a case where you have to have a count star answer that's, that's one that I tend to recommend to people if they must have something accurate and they can't afford to do a count star um, at runtime. All right, so a bit of a review. Um, increased work mem, increased maintenance work mem. So maintenance work mem is used by vacuum. It's also used by creating indexes. So those are kind of maintenance operations that is useful to have a higher maintenance work mem for. Regular work mem is for running queries. So depending on what you're trying to improve. Um, effective cache size is an important one to make sure you set correctly. 
Um, always, you know, a lot of people want to consider increasing shared buffers, and that's often the right answer. Although Keith over here has a couple of blog entries that are fantastic for showing different cases where sometimes it's better to go the other way, sometimes it's better to decrease, sometimes it's better to increase. It really depends on what your workload ends up being. Um, partial indexes and functional indexes are fantastic ways to um, deal with funny values in your table. So if you have like a, a column in your table that is null 90% of the time, you probably don't ever care about when it's null. So create a partial index that doesn't index the nulls, right? And if you do that, then when you query the rest of the table for where there's actually a value there, it's really fast, right? Because now the index is way smaller because we didn't have to index all those other tuples. Right? Another case is using functional indexes. Right? You can actually create a function or create an index over top of a function. Right? So what you're actually indexing is the result of this function. And if that's something that you're querying with a lot, you're using that function in your queries a lot, having an index based on that can be really, really handy. Um, there are some caveats on that. The function must be immutable. Um, you can lie to Postgres sometimes if you know what you're doing. And, tell that it's not really immutable is not, but not something I'd recommend without really understanding what you're doing. Um, but that is a caveat on that. Um, do make sure you double check that your query plan is actually using the index when you do this, because what I've seen is people will go create a functional index and then they'll, they'll run the query with like a slightly different thing, right? Somehow the type checking or something in Postgres ends up saying, well, that's not quite the same function. I can't use that. And you end up not using the index and that sucks. Right? You went through all this effort to create it, and then it doesn't get used. So make sure you're testing that this is actually is happening. Right? Another big one, is, and particularly if your writes are slow, is remove any unused indexes. Right? So PG statistics, six we gather, one of the things we track is how many times an index is used. This is some, done inside of PG stat user statistics, or user indexes, rather. So if you don't have an index being used at all, and you don't need it for like a constraint or something, like a primary key, drop it. Right? It's just expensive. It's costing you time on every one of your rights. All right. So that's what I've got. Any questions? Any more questions? Yes? Union versus union all. So that's a great po um, point, too, right? A lot of times people will use union to combine result sets. But if you know those result sets are, not going, are going to be disjoint or you don't care, um, about any duplicates that show up, you can use union all instead. So that's a great point as well, right? If you're doing set-based queries. So I would recommend using CTEs instead for an optimization. If you're looking for an optimization fence, um, you can do that with a union, but I would generally use, um, actually use CTEs, rather. Yeah, yeah, it can also be, yeah, it can also be an accidental optimization fence, that's true. Um, so that's actually, that's another thing to point out about CTEs is that because they're an optimization fence, that, what that means is that Postgres will consider just that CTE and optimize just that CTE, and then it'll optimize the next CTE, but it won't put the whole thing together right, for you. And so what that ends up being is that there can be cases where that ends up being slower. right? It means that we can't create as good a plan as we could if you use subselects instead of a CTE. Because it's a, uh, CTEs are optimization fences. Yes? into a CTE, you mean? There's been discussion. We actually don't even have to do that, right? Um, so I understand where you're coming. The, the question was about um, whether we might consider using what foreign data wrappers do to allow uh, things to be pushed down uh, across a foreign data wrapper to another server. You know, the question is, could we do that for CTEs? And it's like, yeah, we could, but we actually don't even need to do that, right? We can just rewrite the entire thing, you know, essentially as sub subqueries if we wanted to. Right? Or you know, there's other things we could do with that. But it, it's actually intentionally made an optimization fence. Right? Um, I, there's been some question about, should we pro give people the option? You know, we could actually make it optional, whether a given CTE is going to cause an optimization fence or not. Um, but I think that really cries for use cases right? and examples of where that's necessary and where it's not. Um, so I have to go like, run the lightning talks in five minutes. So if you do have other questions, Please come find me. Um, I'm happy to chat about Postgres anything, and I will definitely be at the reception. So thank you all very much.